Good morning. It's great to see all of you this morning, and thank, thank you for those who are joining us online. And uh, a couple of things, uh, you probably have heard that the topic today is, uh, why does God care who I sleep with? And what you may not know is uh, every sermon series, the main wall in the lobby as you come in, they try to put up graphics that illustrate the sermon series. You may have noticed that the wall was blank today because not one member of our team could come up with anything that we would put up on the wall. So <clears throat> we'll see what happens next. Just before I go into the message, I do want to bring you up to speed on some updated COVID guidelines. And that is uh, beginning next Sunday, we are strongly recommending all individuals to wear masks while indoors. This is not a mandate by the state or we would treat it as such. And we're not making it a mandate here. It's a strong recommendation. Now I know that this has been a very divisive issue in our culture. And what I would say is, first of all, it is not my goal to change anyone's mind. That's not my objective. I'm not trying to convert you to one side or another on a mask issue. I'm trying to convert people to Jesus. So that's my message. That's my message. That's where I'm after. But there are going to be people who think differently than you do. This is one of uh, this is a place where one of our primary values is hospitality. And that means that because everyone matters to God, everyone is welcome here. And we want to treat each other with dignity and respect, even though they may think very differently or act differently than we do. How many think we're capable of that? What do you think? Okay, that's great. That's both of you. Um, in case you're wondering, I, there's, there's a fair number of questions that come up about this, and a lot of people want to know what's driving our decisions. And what I can tell you is that it's not politics and it's not fear. In fact, for the entire COVID time, we've never made a single decision based on a political position or based on fear. The driving principle is a simple question. What does love require of me? That's the question. And then we try to have conversations with people who have decent information. And so that's where we are on that. Now, some people think that I did a COVID announcement just to distract you from the sex talk that we're going to have today. And some people think that I'm doing a sex talk to distract you from the COVID announcement today. Uh, human sexuality is actually a very sensitive topic. And I think it's important to know what I'm saying, but also who I am saying it to. And what I want you to know, it is not my goal, it is not my objective to try to get people who are not followers of Jesus to live according to a Christian standard. It, trust me, it is really hard to get Christians to do that. It's impossible to get non-Christians to do that. So that's not uh, my objective. If you are not a follower of Jesus, what I am hoping is that you will listen to what a pastor who believes in the biblical guidelines has to say on the topic, because what I will tell you is, is that media and social media will define our position and they will tell you what I think. And what I will tell you is not only is their information wrong, many times, people who hold to spiritual values or biblical values are painted in a light that is destructive. And so even if you don't agree with what I'm going to say, I would appreciate it if you would at least listen to what I'm actually saying so that you can compare your beliefs and values to what we actually believe rather than what a culture tells us that we believe. The biblical value of, of human sexuality has always been countercultural, always. So not only am I not trying to impose my values on someone else, I am not here to make people feel better about our culture. I'm not an evangelist for our culture. Every single place that the gospel has been preached, when it comes to issues of human sexuality, family, it has been a countercultural standard. And what's challenging is not the silence of the Bible on human sexuality. What's challenging is what the Bible actually says 
about human sexuality. Scripture indicates that human sexuality is designed by God for more than one purpose. And yet our culture insists that there really is only is one reason people engage in sex. As few as 10 years ago, our culture looked down on Christian values regarding human sexuality as though they were outdated, puritanical, and prudish, just out of step with the times. In the last 10 years, that has changed. Today, the culture has decided that Christian values are dangerous. If you believe what scripture says, what culture says now is that you are causing harm in our world. And so I would like to kind of address that. Now, in this series, it's only two messages, and I've, I've only done two messages on purpose. Um, I'm not going to be able to cov cover every question anyone would have. And uh, if I were to take long enough to do that, uh, it would be a really long series. And I don't think... Uh, um, people today have the stamina for that kind of length of series about human sexuality. But let's start with this. The reason God cares about who you sleep with is because God cares about you. The reason God cares who you sleep with is because God cares about you. The stories in our culture of pain, of regret, of damage are piling up and they're increasing in volume. You cannot escape it. And none of these stories are caused because people chose to live within the boundaries of biblical values regarding human sexuality. Every one of these stories, every one of these stories is caused by people who chose to violate those values and accept the values of our current culture. God is actually the one who designed sex. It's his idea. And when people go outside of his ideas, it causes real pain, and real consequences in real people's lives. Now, before I go any further, what I want you to know is the same God who designed sex is also the same God who provides forgiveness and for healing for those who have been hurt or who have been damaged, either by the decisions they have made or by the decisions that others have made towards them. In our culture, we've seen Hollywood, which has been saturated with accusations about sexual harassment. These are supposed to be the people that are the most uh, forward thinking on human sexuality. And in fact, the hashtag Me Too actually came out of accusations involving uh, ac uh, uh, Hollywood and people involved in the film industry. Um, there was a person who was telling their story and she put it up on Twitter and she said, if anybody else has had an experience like this, just hashtag me too. In one year, over 19 million people used that hashtag. They had been the recipient of sexual harassment and sexual abuse. There was a young woman named Caitlin who wrote an article in the Atlantic Journal about a time in high school when she, when a young man attempted to rape her in a car in an empty parking lot. And after a struggle, he eventually stopped and took her home, but she never spoke about that to anyone. And the reason she didn't is what's absolutely compelling. This is a quote from her. She said, I told no one. In my mind, it was not an example of male aggression used against a girl to extract sex from her. It was an example of how undesirable I was. It was proof that I was not the kind of girl you took to parties or the kind of girl you wanted to get to know. I was the kind of girl you took to a deserted parking lot and tried to make give you sex. This is what our culture is producing. And there's no shortage of damaged, broken, wounded lives as a result of the gospel of our culture regarding sex. Me Too is screaming out that sexuality matters and sexual violation leads to the deepest emotional and psychological damage. And what's interesting is that Jesus was known for his connection with people who were marginalized and people who were vulnerable. 
That's who Jesus most connected with and ministered to. So it might be worth seeing what Jesus actually had to say about human sexuality. And this passage is going to unsettle quite a number of people. It's found in Matthew, the fifth chapter. It's verses 26, uh, uh, 27 and 28. And this is what it says. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That's in the Ten Commandments, right? But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's referring to the seventh commandment, which prohibits adultery. And Jesus actually provides some fresh insight that was absolutely revolutionary in his day and quite honestly is in our day as well and completely countercultural. Jesus is saying that sexual sin isn't limited to what happens in a bed. Sexual in sin, sexual sin includes what happens in your head. That's what he says. And our culture doesn't feel any more comfortable about that. This is what he's saying. How you think about and look at another person matters to Jesus. Lustful looks is not just noticing someone is attractive. Lustful looks is deciding you want that person in bed. So lots of people would say, so what difference does that make? I'm not hurting anybody. A person's sexuality is precious and it's valuable and it should be honored by everyone. A person's sexual integrity should not be violated even in someone else's mind. That's what Jesus says. What right do we have to go there in our head? And what makes us think that we can have those kinds of thoughts and act like we don't have those kinds of thoughts. This is where Jesus lands on this issue. How we treat each other sexually matters to God. So why does it matter? Very famous story, probably the most famous story, about King David other than killing a giant was his affair with Bathsheba. David was not off to war when the time that armies went off to war. And uh, he was restless on a night. He was up walking around on his roof. Roofs back then weren't like our roofs with pitches. They were flat. And he's walking around and he sees a woman who's taking a bath at night. She's assuming that she's got privacy. He sees her. She's a beautiful woman. And he's immediately attracted to her. He, we don't have to imagine what's going on in his head. He acts it out. He sends his servants to her house, has her brought to his palace, where then he has sex with this woman. Her name is Bathsheba. So as it turns out, she becomes pregnant as a result of that encounter. And when she shares that information with King David, he immediately goes into cover-up mode. If it doesn't matter, why do people do that? So what he does is he invites Bathsheba's husband, his name is Uriah, to come in from battle under the guise that he's going to bring updated information from the military conquest or the efforts in the theater of operation in which they're engaged. He gives this report to King David, and King David says, I really appreciate the report. Spend the night. Go home tomorrow. Go ahead and go home. And David's assumption is that because he couldn't control his sexual appetites, nobody else could either, and the husband would just go home. But he doesn't. And David is told that by his servants the next morning. And he asks this guy, why did you not go home to your wife? And the man says, I'm connected to a band of brothers who are sleeping in tents and putting their lives on the line. They don't get to enjoy their families. And while they're doing that, I'm not going to enjoy mine. So David figures, well, what I can do is I'll have him stay another night. This time I will get him drunk, which he does. And his, the, the alcohol, the, the stupor that he will be in will erode his capacity to withstand wanting to go home and be with his wife. But what he found out is, is Uriah actually spent the night on the front porch of the palace and never went home. So David goes to plan C. And plan C is to send the note back with Uriah that tells his band of brothers, the guys that he felt such a close connection with, that I want you to put Uriah in the very thickest of the battle and at the moment when he's the most vulnerable, I want every one of you to back away from him and leave him alone and I want him to die there. And that's exactly what happens. 
So God sent a prophet by the name of Nathan to confront David. Why? Because this matters to God. It matters to God. Sexual assault is a violation of sacred space. It's the violation of a person that God has made. People are not irrelevant to God. Uh, we've all heard the stories of the U.S. women's gymnast national team where a doctor was found guilty of sexually assaulting dozens of young women and girls. When this individual was on trial, and the sentencing was about to begin, a woman wo walked into the court and addressed the judge directly. And her question was, what is the value of each one of these girls? Because if there is a light sentence, what you're telling them is that what happened to them doesn't matter. Go ahead and ask Jesus what the value of each one of those girls is, and he will tell you they are priceless. They are precious. They don't deserve that, not ever. And the reason he does that is not because he has a low view of human sexuality. It's because Jesus' view of human sexuality is so high. The Christian view is not that we are ashamed of sex or embarrassed about human sexuality. The values are higher than that, much higher than our culture values human sexuality. Our culture does not act like people matter. It acts like pleasure matters, even if people are damaged by it. That's our culture's message. Now, I will be the first to acknowledge there's not a shortage of Christians who are actually embarrassed about and ashamed of human sexuality. They think that there is something dirty about it. And that's not what Scripture teaches. And sometimes they, they misunderstand passages of Scripture like this. It's from the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the church in Thessalonica. It's the fourth chapter and the third verse, and it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified and that you should avoid sexual immorality. And they go, you see, God and the Bible, they're just against human sexuality. That verse does not say it is God's will that you should be sanctified and avoid sex. It says it is God's will you should be sanctified and avoid sexual sin. It's not the same thing. Christians believe that some sexual behavior is wrong. It's out of bounds. It shouldn't happen. And they also believe that some sexual behavior is healthy and it's good and it's life-giving. That's what Christians believe. There is, it's not what our culture believes, but it is what Christians believe. Our culture basically says this, right? As long as it's too consenting adults. It's all that matters. There's a difference between coercion and consent. And what I will tell you is our culture cannot tell the difference. They often refer to coercion as consent. When a Hollywood movie mogul suggests to a struggling young actress that they have sex, do you really think that's two mutually consenting adults? Who has all the power in that equation? Really? But our culture will say that's two consenting adults. And by the way, you don't have to be a movie mogul or a celebrity or a powerful politician or a famous religious leader. It's almost never the case that two people come into relationship with the exact same power levels as each other. And our culture has no way to define it, no way to describe it, no way to deal with it in any way. Did you say yes, or at least did you not say no, and that's all that matters? Is a person's desire to fulfill their sexual fantasy or their desire 
the most important thing in our world, even when it wounds and damages others, is every sexual desire in our world healthy? No one says that it is, including non-Christians. Are some forms of sexual behavior harmful? Everyone says some forms are. They might not all agree on what those are, but there's no one who says no matter what, anything goes. Shouldn't everyone demonstrate self-control? And that's where our culture doesn't like it anymore. Sex isn't just physical. It isn't just the equivalent of satisfying an appetite. It was a, a phrase that the Corinthian church used to use. They would say something like this. Food is for the belly and the belly is for food. And they were referring to sexual things. They were saying that if you have a sexual appetite, it's just like eating a good meal. No, it's not. It's not like listening to music and enjoying it. If someone comes over and ruins your meal, you will not have an emotional and psychological wound that often accompanies you for the rest of your life. If someone interrupts a musical concert that you're enjoying, it will, it will annoy you, but it will not wound you. It's not the same. Sex isn't just physical. When someone says sex doesn't matter, they're usually trying to have sex with someone, and they're saying it's no big deal. If it's no big deal, then why do they want it so badly? Why is that acceptable? Sexual assault is not just a bruise on someone's body. It is the trauma of a holy space that has been desecrated. It is God's intent that the deepest levels of intimacy deserve the highest levels of commitment. And that's why he plays it with, places it within the context of a covenant relationship called marriage. The reason sex matters to God is because people matter to God. And before you, you get frustrated about that, why should God care who you sleep with? Why do you care who you sleep with? You won't just sleep with anybody. Why? Because it is different and it is more than our culture is telling us. God is offended, not by sexuality. He's offended when we treat people like a commodity. I used to go to Syracuse uh, twice a week, and I would leave very early in the morning, and there is uh, uh, one coffee shop that was open when I would leave. And so I would get there, and they, they were open by 5.30, and so I would go through their drive through at 5.30 in the morning. And, and what I can tell you is, the reason that I went to that coffee shop was, first of all, I like their coffee. Second of all, they were actually open. I didn't want, I wasn't gonna wait. If they didn't open until six, I wouldn't buy their coffee. Third was, is that uh, their coffee was, uh, I thought, reasonably priced. It wasn't overly expensive. And so, because it was convenient, and I liked the coffee, and, and, and it didn't cost me too much, then that's where I'd buy my coffee to go to, to Syracuse. And so I would get my coffee, and that cup would last me all the way till I got to Syracuse. Okay. Now, if they changed the coffee so that it was terrible, I wouldn't have, have bought that coffee anymore. If they raised the price, if they doubled the price, I wouldn't have bought that coffee. If they, if they opened the store later in the morning, I wouldn't have waited until they opened the store. It's a commodity. As long as it's convenient, as long as it's not too expensive, as long as I enjoy it, I will do my business with that establishment. And there are people who treat sex the exact same way. They treat people like a commodity. As long as I enjoy it, as long as it's convenience, as long as it doesn't cost me too much, that's the kind of relationship that we will have with each other. But if any of those things change, I will take my business someplace else. And no one in our culture feels good about being treated like a commodity. Human life, I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. 
I know some of you are breathing a sigh of relief right now. Thank God. I should have had t-shirts. I survived a message with Pastor Bob. If human life is sacred to God, doesn't it make sense that the process by which life is created is also sacred to God? And that's the Christian position. Christianity is not opposed to sex. It's opposed to treating people like property and a commodity. It's opposed to saying that as long as your pleasure is satisfied, whatever the consequences that causes doesn't really matter. Christianity doesn't believe that. Jesus weighed in and said, even the thoughts that you think are going to determine how you treat someone. And you don't have a right to violate them at any level, including in your own head. Now, whenever I talk about something like this, I'm aware that there can be a fair amount of trauma. Some stuff gets stirred back up that you've been trying to keep down for a while. Or maybe you're engaged in activity and now you're feeling a little bit bad about that. And uh, so I would, I would tell you a couple of things. One is, um, you can go onto our website today, and if you use the URL R for Rochester, calvary.org forward slash conversations, you can schedule an appointment. All we need is your name and your email address, and you'll have a drop down list of people that you would feel comfortable talking with. Those, there's both male and female options on that. Because we know this can stir things up. Second thing that I would tell you is that God actually has gifts available for us today. For some, it will be the gift of forgiveness, that sexual sin is not unforgivable. David and Bathsheba were forgiven. Now, it doesn't mean there's no collateral consequences. They actually, the child that she was pregnant with did not survive. And in addition to carrying along some of the guilt about how they got into that situation, they had to intermix that with grief. And that's a really hard way to live. And what you need to know is that there's fresh and full forgiveness available today. There's also a gift of healing. This is something that I... Uh, our culture will tell you you don't need healing. Our culture will tell you it didn't matter, but God knows it matters and he can give healing to the traumatized, the broken, and the wounded intimate places of your heart today. And there's the gift of repentance. Repentance isn't just strengthening your will. Your will is what got you into trouble to begin with. Repentance is learning to think differently, to see things differently than you saw them before so that you have different options to exercise. And that's the gift of repentance. And that's why I thought that maybe it's perfectly appropriate that we have not just a blank wall where we didn't know what graphics to put up. Maybe what it represents is a fresh start. That today can be a turning point. Where there's forgiveness, and there's healing and a new way to think about human sexuality. Father, thank you today for your word. I know this is not what our culture teaches. It never has. Our culture keeps trying to find ways to mitigate the damage and medicate the pain, but you're the one who gives us the truth and you bring healing and forgiveness. And so we ask that you would break into our hearts and into our minds and into our world with a way that we can actually live out all the joy and pleasure you intended in healthy ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.